takes more than just knowledge. It takes this connection with Guru sincerely initially. So, um, I'm taking shelter of Guru and I'm also taking shelter of this Vipralama Dharma, this place where we are now. This um, is such a holy place. This is where Mahaprabhu manifested his Vipralamba pastimes. Mahaprabhu wanted to taste the happiness that Sri Radha experiences from receiving the sweetness of Krishna's love. And also to understand the glories of Radha and to taste his own, Krishna wanted to taste his own wonderful sweet qualities. So these three desires were fulfilled here in Puri Dhamma by Mahaprabhu in the association of Swaradhamma Dhamma Vrayamananda in the Gambira daily, every night. He spent 18 years, 12 years specifically, in deep meditation in the Gambira. Six years traveling and six years summoning festival, etc. But 12, that's 24 years altogether in this Lila. And of course, we have Jagannath Baladeva and Subhadra, who we are also taking shelter of. So we have all the support. We have everything. We have nothing lacking. So, coming to this subject matter of the 10th canto, initially we need to clarify the Satyam Paramahimahi, or the understanding of what is the goal of this Bhagavatam. If we just take this Brindav Lila out of context with the other 12 cantos, you're not getting the full entirety of the picture that Vyasadeva and Shukadeva Goswami are presenting. So in the Mangalacharyan verse, the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, Janmadi Asya Yatani Vyadi Kalatas Kalateshu Abhinasura Tene Brahma Kridi Vyadi Kavaya Muyati Yatsuraya Teje Vari Mridam Vyata Vilimoya Yatra Trisarva Misha Dana Svena Sadani Rasta Kuka Satyam Paramadimahi This is the invocation for this whole Bhagavatam. And in principle, this, these last three words, Satyam Parma Dimahi. This is saying what is the highest place for meditation for the um, aspiring Sadhak. Where is this Bhagavatam taking us? Unless we understand where the Bhagavatam is taking us, how can we appreciate these pastimes of Krishna's Balya and Hogadya Lila in Vrindavan? these pastimes with him, fighting with the demons. How can that really be properly seen in perspective? So, Krishna Chakravarti Thakur has given five explanations of this goal. And our beloved Gurudev has also given five. Practically, they are the same. There's a slight difference. Shri Krishna Chakravarti Thakur, he makes his first explanation that uh, worship of that Supreme Lord, that Supreme Personality, who is not described necessarily in form, but is the universal or pervasive potency or power of the world. This is the first explanation. And the second is Lord Narayan and his pastimes in Vaikuntha. This is the greatness, the Aishwarya Baba mood of the Lord. And then the third is Madhurya Dharma itself, or Madhurya Mood, Madhurya Bhava. This is sweetness. This is actually the ultimate goal. And then again further, that Radha and Krishna, service to them, are the ultimate goal. This is the fourth one. And then the fifth goal, the bhakti that Sri Vishnu Chandra describes, is Bhakti Devi herself. So this is what I've just been describing previously is a, an appreciation of where is our bhakti coming from. It's coming from Sri Guru, empowered by Gauranga Mahaprabhu and his associates. So, and bhakti, I said, 
is already residing in the heart of the jiva but needs to be ignited. So, how to get this focus, this bhakti, bhakti devi? This is the purpose of Srimad Bhagavatam. Now, our beloved Guru has given five explanations also, and he has included in his fourth explanation that only worship of Sri Radha is the principle of Satyam Paramati Mahi. And then higher even than this worship is worship of Sri Gauranga Mahaprabhu. So my Gurudev gives the Satyam Paramati Mahi as we focus on Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This in his secrets of the Bhagavatam. This is what he's described. So this is our background, so to speak. So there are 12 cantos, as I've described, and the first nine cantos are creating an environment or atmosphere for us to have the eligibility to tread into the 10th canto. The 10th canto is a very confidential um, description of the Lord's pastimes. It's increasing in confidentiality. So throughout the Bhagavatam, the most beautiful relationships are being described by Shukadeva Goswami. Shukadeva Goswami makes his appearance in the 19th chapter of the first chapter. So in essence, Shukadeva Goswami begins his description to Parikshit Maharaj, answering his questions in the second canto. The second canto is really where Shukadeva Goswami starts to describe the Virata Rupa, etc. And also he describes the Chatu Shloki, is also described in the second canto. But at the end of the second canto, in the last chapter, there are ten chapters in the second canto. And in the last chapter, then he describes the ten topics that are going to be discussed in the Bhagavatam. So actually, up until this point, up until the beginning of the third canto, it hasn't really begun, so to speak. It's been creating a very auspicious environment and atmosphere and background. It begins with the sages asking Sudha Goswami so many questions at Naira Sharanya. And then Sudha Goswami is answering according to his understanding what he heard in Hastinapur from Shugadeva Goswami. Nami is perhaps um, six or seven hundred miles from Hastinapur. And there on the um, Golok River in uh, Nami Sharanya is where the sages gathered to perform a thousand year yajna. And during that time, Sutta Goswami, he travels to Hastinapur and he hears this conversation between Parikshit Maharaj and Shukadeva Goswami. I'm describing the background, I'm trying to paint a picture of the whole Bhagavatam. Really, Rajanath Prabhu was describing, I'm going to talk about the Anandas. Actually, I'm not going to talk very much about the Anandas at all. That's a very secondary topic. My Gurudev would not discuss that extensively when he discussed these pastimes. Mostly he would be excited and enlightened by hearing the sweetness of Krishna's pastimes in connection with the demons. It was Raj Lila that actually he wanted to hear. I can remember two or three times speaking on some demon and then I would start into a whole long, you know, explanation of the anarchy and would have said it down. And he was not always wanting to hear the we will describe, according to Bhakti Pinot's Thakur's Krishna Samhita, of course, what they are, but the principle that I want to share with you is the appreciation particularly of Braj. Because it's Brajadam where all the highest, sweetest pastimes are described. If it's Bhakti that we have come here to aspire to be enlightened by and achieve, then Brajadam and the Braja pastimes are the places where that Bhakti will be directly inspired and even experience when we're considering Krishna's pastimes there. But just initially, I'm just trying to paint a picture and make a platform for entrance into these confidential 
So, um, Sudhakar Swami is describing to Sonaka Rishi. Sonaka Rishi is an elderly personality who is the most senior amongst, and Sudhakar Swami is the most um, erudite scholar and empowered by Baladev Prabhu. His father was Ramahasana Sutta. And we know the story of Baladev went into that same assembly and he took the push because Ramahasana didn't honor Baladev. Baladev is a Khan Guru Mula Tattva himself. And all rose when Baladev went into that assembly. So I'm going to be describing many things. Some people are newer and some people are older. I hope that it will be sufficient enough to out a package for you to get something from what I'm describing. So Baladev Prabhu, he killed the father of Sutta Goswami, but he installed Sutta Goswami. And it's Sutta Goswami who is speaking the words of the Bhagavatam and describing from the second canto the direct conversation of Shukadev with Parikshit Maharaj. But up until that time, he's just expressing all these truths directly to the sages of Nandasharani. It's an interesting point that Shri Krishna Chakravartyaka makes that the sages initially gathered at Nandasharani were not advanced bhaktas. Actually, they were not bhaktas particularly at all. They were sages with aspiration for Swadaloka. They were sages with aspiration for moksha, etc. This was their intention initially. So it's like us gathering to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. We are coming from that same background. So the science of Bhagavatam is going to take us through to become lovers of Krishna or attracted to Krishna, bhaktas of Krishna. This is the, the Bhagavatam itself is teaching in this way. Bhagavatam itself is the teacher or the guiding light. The Srimad Bhagavatam is as brilliant as the sun. It has arisen just after the departure of Lord Krishna for his other bhava, accompanied by religion, knowledge, etc. Men who have lost their vision shall get light from this Bhagavad Purana. So this is the condition we find ourselves in this world. It's covered in darkness. Day by day, we see the covering more intensely. So, the first um, cantos from Canto 3 is when Shukadev Goswami begins to describe the conversation between Vidura and Maitreya. And then it goes into uh, Vamana Dev, Pastimes, etc. in Canto 3. And then it rolls through Dhruva and Prithu Maharaj, and then Ajamil, and then Ritrasura, and Indra's Pastimes, Shriketu. And then in the uh, second canto, we have Prahlad Charita, eighth, cha eighth canto, is the demons and uh, the devas battling it out. And then the ninth canto, it begins quite a historical description of the different dynasties. So if you understood what I've just gone through, I've just gone through nine cantos in like two sentences. So if you're up to speed with the Bhagavatam, you will appreciate that connection. So now we're into the ninth canto and the very last chapter, I think it's chapter 28 of the ninth canto, starts to describe the dynasty of the Yadus, the Yadava dynasty. And at this time, Parishit Maharaj, understand, Parishit Maharaj's condition, he's about 40 years old at this time. He was in the womb at the very end of the battle of Kurukshetra. Because at the end of the Kurukshetra war, Krishna came to Hastinapur. And at the very end of the Kurukshetra war, Ashwatthama killed those five sons. And then Arjun was pursuing Ashwatthama. This is all in the sixth chapter of the first canto. Then he was pursuing Ashwatthama. And Ashwatthama became very afraid. And he, in his fear, out of fear, threw a Brahmastra weapon. 
wanting to kill Arjun and the other four Pandavas. And that was um, counteracted by Arjun. Remarkable occurrence. Like more than 10 nuclear bombs were actually transported into the atmosphere and a huge explosion took place there. But Ashwatthama still hadn't finished. He now wanted to annihilate the last remaining heir to the Kuru dynasty. So he sent another Brahmastra to the womb. And Kunti Devi, she's terrified, calling that an iron arrow is coming straight to my womb. This was... Uttara. Uttara, sorry. sorry, sorry. Uttara, Uttara. And she ran to Krishna, beseeching. Krishna was just leaving um, Hastinapur and took shelter of Krishna. And this time Krishna enters the womb of Uttara and he's circling, it's described, loitering around with his club, is the language that Bhaktivedanta Swami uses, deflecting that um, nuclear weapon. And Parikshit, as a child in the womb, he's perceiving that. And he becomes very curious, who is that person? And Parikshit means a person who is searching for. His whole life he was searching for that same personality he saw in the womb of his mother. So this pastime happened about 40 years prior to the speaking of the Bhagavatam by Shukadeva Goswami. So Parikshit Maharaj is approximately between 35 and 40 years old at this time. Because after Kurukshetra, there was some Dantavakra had to be killed at that time. Then uh, Shishupa, uh, not Shishupa, uh, Salva also at that time after. And then um, uh, beautiful pastimes between the Pandavas and Krishna. And then finally Krishna, he leaves this world. And then Parikshit Maharaj takes control of the kingdom. And then we know the pastime of his curse by Srini, that Brahman boy, to die within seven days from the snake bite for dishonoring his father, that Muni he dishonored. This is the story of the Bhagavatam. If you're not familiar, actually it's described by Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur that for the devotees, they are never ever tired of hearing these pastimes from the Bhagavatam. Even if they've heard them a thousand times, they are still so enlightening and inspiring because they're full, saturated with Krishna. And when we hear these pastimes about Krishna, then our intrinsic nature, our spirit soul is automatically inspired in that direction towards Krishna. The purpose of this whole Bhagavatam Ultimately, is to develop attraction for Krishna. Bhagavan Brahma Karsena Tira Vekhyasya Manasya Tal Vyakhyasya Kukhesu Ratir Atman Yitoba Vet. This means that Lord Brahma is saying that he has um, understood that the purpose of the Veda, the Vedas, is simply to develop attraction for Krishna. So, this um, seminar we're going to be going through is about that attractive person, Krishna. This is what it's about because it's contained within the Bhagavatam. This is my subject matter. It's from the Srimad Bhagavatam. So I can't separate this presentation as a seminar without spreading the whole Bhagavatam out. Otherwise it has no significant context. It's just a story about a demon and an art. But if we can see and appreciate the entirety of the picture, the whole concept of Srimad Bhagavatam, then we can get a wealth of bhakti from this um, description, from hearing about the Bhagavatam. So now we come to the tenth canto. The first nine cantos are described as Sambandha Gyan. They're developing a relationship with Krishna. They're developing a an understanding of the material energy. And this is what is being developed, Sambandhagyan. The Achari of Sambandhagyan, of course, is Sanatana Goswami, and the Ishtadev is Madan Mohan. So 
That is described within the first nine cantos. In the tenth canto, <clears throat> surprisingly it seems, it's not in sequence. It comes to the Prayojan Tattva. It comes to the Saman Bona. All this touch in Paramahi directly. Because the eleventh canto is describing how to access that Prayojan Tattva. But first we have to know the goal. If we don't know the goal, then what is the value of our practice? So I'm trying to make this presentation, um, trying to balance being a student and being a devotee and being a seminar and being in front of Lord Jagannath in the temple. So, and having newer people and older people and trying to make the whole package somewhat balanced. Coming to my subject matter. We probably won't hit the subject matter perhaps until um, tomorrow morning because there is a prelude actually before we can reach the first deeper. So I hope you're appreciating the platform that I'm trying to establish so that hearing about the demons will have so much more significance. If we just hear about the demons separately, what is its value really out of context? It doesn't hold connection really. It's separated from the Satyam Paramadimani. Satyam Paramadimani means that highest truth, Parama, Dimahi, to meditate on. Satyam, that purest, highest truth to meditate on. When you're chanting your japa, when you're doing any sort of devotional activity, what is its purpose? What is its value? Are we just like robots still? just running to do activities, not thinking, not conscious. What to speak of Krishna conscious? Are we just acting blindly? We have to consider this Satyam Paramani Dimahi repeatedly. Gurudev has described so many times there is sudden bhakti, bhava bhakti and prema bhakti. If our sadhana is not focused on the bhava, what is the value of our sadhana? It's nothing. It will be just focused on, am I happy in this material world? But we must be focused on Bhava so This is our intention, to come to this mood of brush, which will increase our Bhava Bhakti. So coming to the 10th canto. 10th canto has 90 chapters. Altogether there are 335 chapters in the Bhagavatam. So if you take a vow to read one chapter every day, you get left over one month to catch up on anything you left out before. 365 days in a year, 335 chapters. So you still get 30 days, one month, up your sleeve to catch up if you want to read a chapter every day. It's designed like this. Bhagavatam, every part of the Bhagavatam is specially designed for us in this age. So, even just understanding it mathematically, the way that it's connected, Shilvashna Chakravani Thakur, if you take the time to read all of his commentaries, which are all in English, from the first canto to the twelfth canto, he links all of the chapters together. He links all of the cantos together and he links all of the verses together. There's nothing disconnected. It's all a sublime thread of jewels. Every aspect of the Bhagavatam. So we need to have that appreciation to get the full benefit of the place where we are going now with this particular study. So we come to the 10th canto. 10th canto has 90 chapters. Forty of those chapters are about Dwarka Lila and um, five chapters or seven chapters are about um, Mathura and thirty-two chapters out of ninety are directly about Vrindavan, Brajalina and of those thirty-two chapters Fifteen chapters are about demons. So we have plenty of material. We have a lot of place to examine. 
And this is in the Prayojan Tattva. This is in the highest consideration. It's not Abhideya. Abhideya means the way to access. It's the means to reach the goal. That's in the 11th canto, describing that Buddha Sandesh, etc. These verses are describing how to access Prayojan. I can remember many times when Gurudev first went to Australia. Australia is not a place of high knowledge. And he first of all spoke the highest rustic truths in Australia. He spoke about Rishabhamanandini, uh, Vyogini, Samyogini. He spoke these topics very, and it wasn't until his third visit that he brought it down to Upadesh Amrita. But he gave the Satyam Paramadimahi first. Unless you have the encouragement and inspiration to go to the goal, unless you know the goal clearly, why would you bother to practice devotional service? Unless you know what is the goal, how can you practice? If you don't know where you're going, how can you really go with enthusiasm? So this is the nature of the 10th canto. So 90 chapters of the 10th canto, and 40 of those are Dwarka, and 32 are directly Braj, and 5 are Matura, and then there are 3 that are Kurukshetra. That's 84, I think, 83. 82, 83, 84. Kurukshetra chapters. Huh? Oh, well, there's Ujjain. And there's Akrur, Akrur in Hastinapur. And there are some odd chapters like that that are separated. So there's two Kurukshetra. Three, three chapters are describing Kurukshetra. Actually, I have a list here that I can mail to you all if you want to give me your email addresses, I can mail to you this morning, of all the chapters of the Srimad Bhagavatam. But I have a better copy than this with the um, titles also by Srila Vishnath Chakravani Thakur because the titles are really relevant and there's some um, speciality in Srila Vishnath Chakravani Thakur's words. Actually, Srila Vishnath Chakravani Thakur it, well, it's a translation by Banaswami which is very enlightening but when we have read that, we come back to such a special mood that Prabhupada wrote in his commentary, which is actually not there in Sri Vishnu Chakravarti's commentary. The, the bar, so to speak, is not the same. Actually, in Prabhupada's commentary, it's very, very special and sweet. It's even though the knowledge is there in Sri Vishnu Chakravarti's So if anybody wants a copy of this, and they can appreciate all the different chapters, etc. And see, because for many people, this 12-volume literature is quite intimidating. They think, oh, I will never read this in my whole life, this is so beyond me. But if we discuss it in this way, how many chapters here and this and etc., it becomes so much more accessible. It breaks it apart, at the same time, it breaks it together. So, Coming back to the subject matter, in the first five chapters of the tenth canto, it's taking place in Mathura. And there there are prayers to demigods, etc. But it's describing this, I won't say first demon of Raj, because Kamsa is not a demon who has the Adhikar to even enter Raj. But he sends all his servants. Kamsa, remember, defeated all of these different demons. There are 21 demons that I hope we'll have time for some of them or most of them. If we don't finish them, it doesn't really matter. I was just telling Brenda this morning. My purpose in speaking this is to try and inspire you all to take shelter of Srimad Bhagavatam through the mercy of Guru and Gauranga to actually study this, go away with this, with an inspired mood to study in Dima. I will give one description of all these, but I'm hoping that it will sustain itself 
over the next years with you, and then you'll take something away that inspiration to study more deeply. Otherwise, next year you can come back and finish it off. <laughs> so, Kamsa. Kamsa in his previous birth was Kalanini. He was a son of Hiranya Kashipu. And we know the story of Hiranya Kashipu, Great Demon. So Kalanini was born Great Demon. And he was um, ultimately defeated in battle by Vishnu himself. But Kalanini, he um, begged for a benediction from Lord Brahma, just as his father had done. And he wanted that benediction of not being killed by any demigods or any weapon, etc., just like his father. And he got that benediction, and uh, ultimately he was killed by Vishnu, ultimately. So, Kalanini had six sons, called the six Garvas. And those six sons didn't take shelter of their great-grandfather, who or their grandfather rather. I don't mean great in sense, I mean magnificent grandfather. The six sons of Kalanini, the Sadgaras, took shelter of Lord Brahma and not Hiranyakashipu. And they performed austerities to please Lord Brahma. He benedicted them with so much potency. But when they returned to that place, to that palace of Irani Kashipu, he understood that my grandsons had taken shelter of Lord Brahma and not of me. So he became furious and he curses them to actually take birth on in Bhumidevi, on Mother Earth. And he curses their father, who is Kalanini, that in your next birth you will kill your sons. Think about how demonic that sort of curse is. That someone should say, I curse you, you will kill your sons in your next birth. His sons from this birth. Huh? His sons from this birth. His sons from this birth, in their next birth, he will take birth and he will kill his sons. So those six sons, of course, are the sons of Devaki, who comes and kills all of them very happily, his own previous sons. But actually, those six sons we know will uh, request Mother Ganga to uh, arrange for this pastime so quickly they would be abs absolved from this curse to have taken birth on Mother Earth. Those six Garbas didn't want to take birth on Earth. So Ganga Devi, she arranged for them to be killed very quickly. So it was all a benediction. This is a long Mahabharata type pastime. I won't go into that subject here. But basically, Kamsa. So Kamsa took birth um, in the wife of Ugrasen. Ugrasen is the father of Vasudev, who is the father of Krishna. So they're very much connected, related. So the pastime is that Padmavati uh, was visiting her father's house. Satchiprit, his name was. King Satchiprit of Vaidava. Visiting the father's house. And then she went for a walk one day, and a demon called Godila or Drumila, same person, he disguised himself as Ugrasen. Not just disguised, it's like he came as Ugrasen, but he was the demon. When it says disguised, it means they not just putting on a makeup or anything like that, they became like that person. So, um, Pamavati, she had a physical connection with him at that time. It was a beautiful setting, they were very happy birds for singing, etc. So, and then this Drumila, he conceived a child in the womb. This Drumila is a Gandhava, who is like a demon. He's actually a Gandhava, but he's like a demon. So, he impregnated Padmavati who is the wife of Ugrasen, with this child, Kamsa. And Kamsa was present in the womb of Padmavati for 10 years. And Padmavati's mother and father, 
back in the palace when they heard what had actually happened, because after this act, Paparati was very distressed, and she was very unhappy that this demon had come and impregnated her. So the family tried to abort the child with poison, and so many ways they tried to get rid of this child, but they couldn't. And finally this child spoke from the womb, saying, don't try to kill me. You don't know who I am. I am a greatly powerful personality. I was just defeated only by Vishnu. No one else can defeat me. I am such a powerful personality. So when they realized the enormity of this demon, then they stopped trying to abort him. But for 10 years, Padmavati had to carry this child. And finally this demon, Kamsa, was born. I'm describing that background just to see what a great demon Kamsa actually was. And then Kamsa, very quickly, he began to conquer all the other demons of like Putana, etc. Trinavrata, Pralambasura, Bakasura, Agasura, these were all demons, Keshidi, Vyoma, etc. They were all conquered by Kamsa. Kamsa made them his servants. This is all described in Gaga Samhita. In Gaga Samhita is described as Kamsa. So all these demons were under the control of Kamsa, except for one, and that is Putana. He could not defeat Putana. Putana had the strength of 10,000 elephants. If we can just imagine for a moment the strength of one elephant. Imagine one elephant coming in here. Imagine 10 elephants. Imagine a hundred elephants, imagine a thousand elephants, elephants. imagine ten thousand elephants. It's very strong. So Kamsa couldn't actually defeat him, but he's so smart because he's a demon. He made a truce with her, he made an arrangement that would support each other. So the first demon we actually come to is Putana. We'll come to that in a little bit. So um, this is the stage, so to speak, where the tenth canto begins. And of course, we know the pastime when Masudev is taking Devaki on a chariot in her, her wedding day. And then uh, there's an aerial voice saying, Oh, you fool, Kamsa, don't you know that the eighth son of your uh, daughter in law, your, your sister, rather, no, daughter in law, daughter in law, Kamsa is the brother of Masudev. Oh, brother of uh, Devaki. Basically, his sister, and he brought his sister to the house of Vasudev. Right, right, you're right, you're right, you're right. So Vasudev, yes, yes, okay. Sorry. There's so much family tree. Actually, one thing that I'm going to share with you is that all of these Vrindavan pastimes and the Matura pastimes are about Krishna's relationships. And Krishna is related to practically everybody. Vasudev had 18 wives, and they all had husbands and children, etc. So they're all those yadus, they're all directly related to Krishna. And then in Vrindavan itself, when we read uh, Raya Krishna Ganadesh Deepika, Gurudev has described, all of in Braj, they're all related to uh, Krishna. They're all second cousin, first cousin, etc. So, Kamsa is driving his sister, Devaki, and the voice says, Your, the eighth child will kill you. So then immediately Kamsa wants to kill his own sister. This is how demonic he is, just in a moment. We think this is is demonic, we, you know, it's nothing compared to what actually has happened in the past. Even you open the Bhagavatam in the seventh chapter, is the story of Ashwatam beheading these children. It's like immediately this sort of... Uh, blood bar, but we have to understand it with transcendence. It's, it's not just um, a brutal mentality. Actually, there's a whole spiritual culture that is um, manifesting from the Bhagavatam. So, coming back to this subject, um, Kamsa was this big, and all his life, from that point, he was terrified of his death by the eighth son of of the eighth son of Devaki, his sister. So now, um, after these first five chapters of the Bhagavatam, we come into the sixth chapter. And it's the sixth chapter 
that the demon Putna makes her appearance. So Krishna's birth in Matura has been described in the fifth chapter prior. Because remember that Shukadev is speaking to Parikshit, who is a Matura Vasi. So he doesn't want to tell Parikshit that Krishna took birth in Braj, in fact. He tells him that he took birth in a, and Krishna did take birth in Matura. Not birth, but he manifested, appeared, man appeared in a, in a four-armed form in Matura with his conch, this club, uh, lotus, etc. As a 16-year-old youth with beautiful baby hair, etc. This is how he appeared in Matura. But then he immediately became a small child because then he was so afraid and carried across the Jamuna and put in the birth chamber beside Mother Yashoda. And then they took that female child back to uh, Matura and that female child immediately began to cry and cast her, thinking that this was the eighth child. He ran quickly to grab her and kill her. And he picked his, up the feet of that child and wanted to smash her on a rock. But that child slipped from his hands and came into the sky as Badri Kali. So this pastime actually begins with Badri Kali. This is actually the beginning of the Putana pastime. And then um, uh, Badri Kali told Kansa that he was a fool, that his um, destroyer had already manifested and that he would die, no question, by the hands of his eighth child. So Kamsa was holding all his fear. And at this time, he called his greatest um, demon, who is Putana. Putana is, as I said before, he couldn't defeat Putana. She had the strength of 10,000 elephants. He couldn't defeat her. So he requested her to go to Braj. Putana is described by Jiva Goswami in Gopal Champu as eating children like piles of rice. She would eat babies like a pile of rice. This is her nature. She's a Rakshasi, not just any Rakshasi. She is 12 miles long, two miles wide. That is like huge. If we think of Mount Everest, I think it's five and a half miles, something like that. Double the height of Mount Everest was actually the height of Putana, this demon. So now after the birth of Krishna in Braj, Krishna manifests in Matura from the womb of Devaki as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But he takes birth from the womb of his mother Yashoda in Vrindavan. The Krishna in Vrindavan doesn't have the conception of being God. This is the most beautiful aspect of Krishna in Braj. This is the essential difference. I'm just speaking to Adam as a side, just to explain in case. This essential difference is there. In Matura, he's of the mood, I am that Supreme Personality of God. This is called Aishwarya, which means like awe and reverence, majestic, Baba. But the mood in Braj is only Madhurya. Because these pastimes could not take place if Krishna was in the conception that I am God. Krishna is Sarvagya and Mugdata. He's knowing everything and yet at the same time, he doesn't know anything. This is totally inconceivable for our consciousnesses. It's called achintya, that means inconceivable bhav. So when Krishna manifests in Braj from the womb of Mother Yashoda directly, because there's this jati ceremony where they cut the umbilical cord, and all the Vrajvasis actually see that Krishna has been born in Braj. Then come um, Nanda Baba, he wants to, he knows how vicious Kamsa is in Matura. Matura physically 
is about eight or nine kilometers from Vrindavan. Krishna takes birth in Gokul, which is actually across the Jumuna River. But even though it seems perhaps 15 or 16 miles difference between Mathura and Vrindavan, there is a universe of difference. One time Gurudev described very, very beautifully. He says, if you look at the night sky and you see a constellation of stars, not all those stars are in the same um, distance from this planet. Some stars may be millions and billions of miles further back. So when you look at the Matura Mandal or the Braj Mandal, it's called both, it looks like Matura is in Braj. But Matura is billions of miles different in conception to Braj. You understand? this difference, it's important to appreciate where these demons are coming from to enter Braj. Now how, oh, so Nanda Baba, he decides to keep things peaceful and he decides he will be a dutiful Vaishya and he will go to Mathura to pay his taxes to Kamsa. So Krishna is about three days old at this time. And Nanda Baba very quickly goes to. You correct me if I say anything different. You know what I am saying? No more. Because sometimes it said three days, sometimes it's six days. Different descriptions in different. But basically, a six-day-old baby and a three-day-old baby are quite similar. They're very, very helpless. So Nanda Baba, he's gone to Mathura to pay his taxes. Taxes of all milk products, etc., because that's the wealth of brunch, is milk products. And in the meantime, Putana, she has become afraid of Nanda Baba's archers. Nanda Baba has archers in brunch, and they have what is called an Orion Astra in their arrows. This is what Jiva Goswami describes in Goma Chapel. So she knows this Narayan Astra will expose her and she will be defeated by that Narayan. She can't defeat Narayan. She may be very powerful, but she can't defeat Narayan. So she has to make a plan. How will Putana enter Braj? So she takes the guise of a most extraordinary, beautiful, like a Lakshmi Devi, like a demigod S and she walks into Braj. And when she comes in, most of the fit and strong cowherd men have gone with Nanda Baba to Mathura to assist him there. So all that is left is some younger cowherd men and some older men in Braj. But all of them are totally enamored by the splendor and beauty of Putana as she enters this village of brush. And then she comes in to the courtyard of Yasoda Ma's house. Rohini Ma is there also. Rohini is like the mother of Baladev. And Rohini and Yasoda, they're always together. So she comes in and she comments, Jiva Goswami says, to Yasoda, oh, you don't know how to feed your son properly. And Yasoda it's expressed three or four times by Sri Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur. Never actually feels qualified sufficiently to have this remarkable child as her son. She's always feeling less than qualified. She's feeling, how am I able to actually have... This is a symptom of her deep, deep humility. So when this Rakshasi, Putana, enters the courtyard, then she tells Yashoda, she knows Yashoda is a little feeling inferior about having this child. And she says, to, oh, you don't know how to treat your child properly. How to feed. Only I know how to feed him properly. So then uh, Putana, she um, approaches baby Krishna. And Krishna, first of all, we have to understand how is Putana even able to come into Braj? How can a demon come anywhere where 
the chanting of Hare Krishna and Vedic mantras and all auspicious activities taking place. She doesn't come into trouble. She's invited by Yoga Maya to have her death in brush. She's invited to die. Actually, she doesn't die in brush. She doesn't actually leave her body in brush. But she's invited by Yoga Maya, why? To support Krishna's pastimes. How is that? Everything in brudge is only showing the sweetness of Krishna's relationships with his family members. This is what all of brudge dharma is only about. Principally, the attractive quality and nature and sweetness of Krishna in relationship with his family members. So by Yogamaya allowing these demons to enter brudge, these relationships just blossom to such a degree where they think they're going to lose their beloved Krishna. If you think you're going to lose this person, then you become even more attached, more attracted. Your heart becomes more connected with that soul, with that personality. So this is the dynamic. This is the reason all of these demons, one of the reasons, are constantly coming into brush during Krishna's Balya and Boganda Lila. Balya is when he's very young, up to the age of six. Then Boganda up to the age of 10, and then from 10 to 16 is the Kashore age. So this is in Balya Lila, or Kumara Lila, you can say. Balya Kumara Lila, not the same. So this demon has got possible step to come there to Braj by Yogamaya herself to increase and enhance Krishna's sweet pastimes. And Krishna, he knows Putana, of course. He's also Sarvagya, he's also all knowing. How can we understand this? He's all knowing and not knowing simultaneously. What? Inconceivable. Inconceivable, absolutely inconceivable. If we start to appreciate the inconceivability of it, then it means that we're approaching it from a very humble vision or humble perspective. If we think, oh yes, I understand that better, then you actually lose the, the heart of it. So, when Bhutana approaches Krishna, Krishna closes his eyes. And it's described 19 different reasons why he closes his eyes. The Acharyas, even though they've heard these pastimes a million times before, even though Parikshit has heard this pastime many times before, I'll describe at the end how Krishna advertises this pastime through the sweetness of the smoke when they're burning Putana's body. He wants everyone, so the Amatorabhasis, uh, they already knew this pastime, but Shukadev, he's inquiring so nicely at the end of this Ninth chapter, um, ninth canto, about Krishna's pastimes, that Shukadev becomes inspired to enter Braj because of Shukadev's greed and enthusiasm to hear directly of the sweetness of Krishna. Harish, 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 This mood is very important to enter this tenth canto. So now Putana is approaching Krishna. Krishna closes his eyes. And one reason is described he doesn't want to see such an inauspicious woman who's pretending to be like a mother come to poison him. Putana has smeared very, very, very heavy poison on her breast, that even just a fraction of it would kill any child. And she's come with the intention to murder this child and to eat this child. That's her nature. Another dynamic, another species of life. <laughs> um, so Krishna closed his eyes not to give her his auspicious glance also. He doesn't want to see that woman. He also he wants to avoid um, the shame of killing a woman like a mother and avoid seeing in inauspicious Putana's 
death. So there are many reasons for him closing his eyes. So then Putuna expertly takes the child on his lap and begins to put her breasts in Krishna's mouth. And Krishna actually at this time becomes very angry that this woman is killing so many children in brush. He becomes angry with that. But Sri Krishna Chakravarti Thakur describes, of course, this is not sweet Krishna who is going to kill Putana. This is Krishna's energy. It's called a Samara Shakti. Vishnu Chakravarti as Samara Shakti that actually will kill Putana. So, um, Krishna takes that breast with his two hands and he drinks not only the poison and whatever milk is there in her breast and then he begins to suck up her life air. But it's described by the Acharyas that this actually is a very great benediction for Putana because not even Mother Devaki had her breast sucked by Krishna. Devaki never suckled Krishna on her breast. So Krishna has more than even Devaki has. How can we understand these things? We cannot, unless we're in guidance of the pure Acharyas. But the principle is Achintya, so this fact is there. And then Krishna begins to suck out her very life air. And at this point, Putana comes to her senses completely and realizes this child is going to kill me. And she tries with all her strength of 10,000 elephants to pull the child from her breast. The child, she can't get him off. Krishna is holding on with his feet and his hands. But his lips, principally, it's described that Krishna kills Putana with his lips. The next demon, Trinavrata, he's going to kill with his hands. Oh, the next demon, sorry, Shakatasura, he kills with his feet. So Krishna is just showing his all power in all areas, lips, feet, hands, whatever. Krishna has the power. However you want me to kill him, I will. So, um, then at this time, Uttana rushes out of the house and she assumes her normal Rakshasi 12 mile high <coughs> form. And at this time, uh, Mother Yashoda and Rohini Ma have completely fainted. It's described by the Acharyas that unless they fainted, they would have died in shock at the possibility of their darling son being killed by this darling demon. They would have died of shock. But due to Yogamaya's mercy, they only fainted. So they didn't die of shock. See how... Sariyat. 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 That's not it all. So, um, so, um, Mother Yashoda and Rohini, by the mercy of your mind, are only faint. They don't. But see this dynamic that they would have died. This is showing the attachment and affection. They've already built for Krishna. He's only three days old. But how much total affection? Actually, it's described that when Krishna is this age, he's sometimes crying. And all his relatives come. And they will all pass around the baby Krishna. He's only happy when he's in the arms of his different relatives. So it's described again. The, so many relatives would come to visit Krishna at this time, when he's a little tiny baby. So. Then Putana, remember, 12 miles high, so two steps she takes, that's 24 miles. She's out of brush and she crashes down. Where? Garden of Cups in his mango orchard. And it's described by Vishnu Chakravita that even in her death she's killing living entities for all these mango trees. But it's not in brush, it's Kamsa's orchard. 
that is being demolished. So Putana crashes down there. And then, of course, the younger gopis who didn't pass out, they run very, very quickly, 24 kilometers, very fast. They run to the body of Putana to quickly find if Krishna's okay. And Krishna is still sitting on the breast of Putana, which is like a big hill. Because when Putana's body is lying down, it's described like her teeth are like plowshares. Her eyes are like wells. Her stomach is like, her navel is like a well. And her legs are like uh, river banks. There's this enormous form lying there. But on the breast of it is like the peak of a mountain. And there's Krishna, just <laughs> sitting there. And it's described how the gopis, they run up there, and then they pass Krishna down in a chain. They make a chain of gopis. So they quickly pass him down, very quickly. They don't want to waste any time. And then it's described by Jiva Goswami that they run, jumping and shouting with glee, holding baby Krishna, running back home to revive Mother Yashoda and Rohinima, that actually is okay. But Rohinima doesn't come back to consciousness. And they're trying in so many different ways. And then one elderly gopi, she takes Krishna personally and she puts him right beside Mother Yashoda. Then Mother Yashoda comes back to life. And then again she passes out when she sees Krishna again. But again she comes back to life again. So this dynamic of this heart-rendering relationship is what is really the most significant aspect of allowing Putana to enter brunch. So now, when Nanda Baba is returning from Mathura after having paid his taxes, he becomes astonished. Did he take a wrong road? Has some mountain, flying mountain, suddenly dropped in the middle of the track? What, what is this? And then they start to realize, this actually is a demon. It's actually a Rakshasi. But she's dead. And then Nanda Baba, he thinks, this is remarkable, because last day, his cousin brother just told him that he should go quickly back to Braj after paying the taxes to Kamsa because there were some inauspicious omens going to take place in Braj. So Nanda Baba becomes amazed that his brother has such mystic vision and can perceive that actually this demon came. So he's very afraid because of course he is so attached to Krishna also, so much attached. And then Nanda Baba, he orders Upananda his elder brother. It's interesting actually that five brothers, Upananda, Abhinanda, Nanda, Sunanda, and Nandana. And when their father, Parjanya, was bestowing the kingship of Braj, he naturally said, the elder son, Upananda, you will be the king of Braj, you are elder. But then Upananda, in great um, culture, he said, actually, my second brother, Nanda, is more qualified to become the king of Raj. And then the other four brothers, they also agree. So it's complete opposite of what you would get in the material world. Huh? He was the third brother. He was the third brother, and there were two other younger brothers. So the four brothers all agree that Nanda Baba should be the reigning king of Raj. But it's just beautiful the way that he's not like legitimately should be there, should be Upananda. But they all support Nanda. So we see straight away this cultural mood, this non-envious, this very loving, very real exchanges that are taking place in Braj. This is Vrindavan. So this is Vrindavan Leela, where we are trying to access to appreciate this demon of Putana. So then when he see he asks Upananda to order the lower caste to cut that body up and to burn it. And then, which they do, of course, and then the, the smoke from that, the fragrance from that burning body, it goes to all the local villages around. Not only that, it goes into Swagaloka. Not only that, it goes into the very bottom part of Vaikuntha. It's described, it goes into Sutalaloka. Bali Maharaj, he also smells his friend. So all us, what is the nature of this? This smells so beautiful. This smells like a transcendental fragrance. So they're all asking, oh, don't you know? Krishna just killed Putana demon. So the glories of Krishna are immediately established in the first three days of his prowess, his heroic pastimes. 
just immediately. But this is not the principle. The principle is the relationships that are demonstrated. So then Nanda Baba, he comes back to the family and he's so overjoyed. He won't let Krishna go. He's holding, holding the elderly gopis are saying, no, no, you must give it. No, Nanda Baba is holding, holding, holding. He's, he's, he was so afraid that Krishna could have been killed by this demonic personality. So we don't have a lot of time here. So um, this represents, we have to say something about this. I was saying before that Gurudev never went into great um, happiness describing the anarchists connected with the demons. When we would speak publicly many times on the different demons, um, we would start to explain the different anarchists and Gurudev would often cut us short. We liked to hear the grudge flavor of these demon personalities more than he wanted because our path is not anarta nivriti. Our path is arta pravriti. An arta is something that we don't want. Arta is something that we do want. So better to stay focused on what we do want. And what we do want is Rajabhav. This flavor of brudge. This is actually, this is how I understood from Shiva Buddha. He wanted to give us this mood, not the mood of so much. But nevertheless, Putana represents, of course, false guru. And guru is the initiating um, platform for all um, activities to happen. So the first pastime is Krishna has to annihilate this false guru. False guru in the form of deceitful behavior or encouraging disciples towards sense gratification. Or it's described, trying to describe to younger people something that they don't have the adhikar or ability to actually appreciate. This also is false guru. If you're describing something so lofty and there's no one around who can actually relate to what you're describing, this is also described as false guru. So this false guru is immediately annihilated from Braj. So this is the significance of Putana. Actually, Srila Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati, he's written a beautiful essay on, it's called the Putana essay, and it's all about false guru. Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati and Srila Bhakti Anotaku have written extensively on these demons of Braj, in a, as far looking at the Anartas aspect of that. So, in that description, he describes that, for example, an institution that does not have a pure devotee at its head is no better than a society of drunks. These are his exact words. If you don't have a guiding master who knows clearly, because it gets very mixed, we may know so many aspects of Shastra, we may have had so many years associating with a Mahabhagavad. But unless we've actually had that final understanding and purity and realization, we are not on that same level. So it can become very clouded. And younger people can become very influenced by someone who is not entirely realized. So this is described as false guru. And this particular aspect of wanting fame, wealth, adoration, etc is what a false guru's motivation is. This is actually what he is searching for. Somehow or other, canvassing the world to support his own material desires. And they're very subtle. It's not just physical growth, growth wealth. It's actually that taste of being adored by so many people. And it doesn't just happen to sannyasis. It also happens to greenhouses in family life. They are adored by their family members. This is the same disease. And the father is acting as guru in the family life. But how sincere is that father in family life? Also, is the understanding, I just want to give the pure and the truth to my family members. Or does he have some other mood that he is getting from his family? This respect, adoration, etc. So this disease of 
Patishka uh, and the Kaim adoration, etc., is very strong in the world. So Putana represents this. So Putana is immediately destroyed and it's described in the um, Brahma Vaivarta Purana that previously Putana is Ratna Mala, either the younger sister of Bali Maharaj or the daughter of Bali Maharaj. It's described in both ways. So there are a few other details and topics. Tomorrow you are to do again by Rajanath Guru's mercy and being allowed to have four days run initially and then after the weekend another four days. So then we can get through the different things. But understand the principle that I tried to share with you today. I talked about what is the nature of the Srimad Bhagavatam. I described the twelve cantos. I described some money of the day of the great I described the context coming from the first verse through to the last chapter of the ninth canto, approaching the tenth canto. I described the um, life previously of Kamsa. This is what I went through. And I described um, most of the Putana demon pastime. And the principle that I try to share is the affection that the Brijabhasis feel for Krishna. This will come out more and more and more. And with every demon, a newer and newer sweetness actually emerges of Krishna's very intimate Brajalila. This is what these pastimes, or the way I am presenting them in this forum, about. Focusing on Brajalila. So thank you very much. Thank you.